to the Great Hall. We have a great tutorial with Tom Clark. He will be giving us a guide, the definitive guide to Dunder Methods. And there we go. Let's make him feel welcome. Kia koto, kotamaho. Um, a little bit about me as we start. Um, my, my background behind this, so I am, I am for a bit longer still the, the president of NZ Pug that Rebar is here. Um, I uh, run the API services team for the Dunedin Game Studio Runaway Play. So if at any time you want to talk about how Python fits in with the game industry, I'd be happy to talk about that with you this weekend. Um, and I'm also a lecturer in programming and systems administration at Otago Polytechnic in Dunedin. Um, as we start here today, keep in mind, this is a hands-on tutorial. There is homework. There are programming exercises. Um, so you might want to clone the Git repo here, um, which, besides having these slides, will also give you some programming problems to, to experiment with the ideas that we're going to talk about. And at various times during the tutorial, we'll stop for a few minutes and give you a chance to look at those programming problems. If you're in sort of the target audience for this talk, I don't expect you're going to get through all those programming problems in the time that we have available. So again, there's homework. Um, that's fine. And keep in mind, we're just at the start of the weekend, so I'll be around the whole time. And, and definitely, if at any time this weekend you have a question that comes out of this tutorial, feel free to grab me um, and, and ask me your questions. OK. So the fact that we're all here I think it illustrates that, yeah, that Python is great, and we all love Python, and we probably have, all have our own reasons for loving Python. We probably each have more than one. Um, but if I was going to pick my number one thing that I like about Python, it is the way that Python is very clear and very powerfully expressive. Um, and it's this quality that makes it really easy and natural for me to take my ideas and to represent those ideas in code. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the capabilities that Python gives us to write our code in a way that, that enhances its clarity and its expressiveness. And by way of introduction, let's just start by taking a second to appreciate how cool Python strings are. So we can do a lot of interesting things with strings. I'll create some string objects here, and we'll see that I can compare them with an operator like equals equals. Um, and decide whether two string, two, you know, two string objects have the same value. Um, and because, in the case of strings, there's a concept of lexicographic ordering, so it turns out we can also compare like greater than and less than um, uh, uh, with, with two strings. Um, and it doesn't stop there. Um, we can do things like add two strings together. We decided that there's a sensible interpretation of what does addition mean for strings, and it's concatenation. And since we can add, then it makes sense that we can multiply at least by an integer, and sure enough, we can do that too. We can do more with strings. So since a string is a collection of individual elements, of characters, we can iterate over that collection and obtain the characters in the string one at a time using a construct like a for loop. But even more than that, because this collection has a, a concept of ordering and position, order, ordering of the elements, we can access individual items. We can step into the string and say, can I have uh, the, the individual item at position four in the string? There's this concept of a position and a sequence for a string. And because it's Python, we can even go backwards. We can start at the back of the string and ask for the string at position negative one and get what we want. But it doesn't stop there. And because it's Python, we can slice. We can obtain a substring from a string using syntax like we see here. So I can say, I want the character starting at position 3 in the string, up to but not including the character at position 10. Um, but I want to skip by 2, so I'm going to get every other character. And I want the substring that we obtain as a result of doing that. So, Strings and many of the other built-in types of Python um, get this, this beautiful expressive power from, in part from the way that they support these operations like these. Again, they let us express our thoughts in a way that seems very natural to us, or that we hope seems very natural. I mean, if it was just the built-in types that did that, that would be nice. And in fact, one of the, one of the other things I like about Python is that the built-in types themselves are so powerful that often we don't have to resort to writing a custom class to do what we want to do. 
But still, frequently we do write our own custom classes, and it turns out we can empower those classes with the same sorts of capabilities that things like strings have. And the mechanism that we use to give our strings that expressive power um, is we implement certain dunder methods. Um, now, we could argue that I oversold this a little bit. When I say guided tour of dunder methods, there are a lot of dunder methods that arise in different circumstances. Some of them we use all the time. You probably don't even think of them. Some of them that we're going to see here, uh, in certain situations, are really handy to have available. Some of them are extremely niche. Um, so I'm going to try to, to talk about uh, dunder methods that are sort of in that middle ground. But clearly, there's no way I could give you a guided tour of all of them in the time that we're talking about now. Now, even if you're relatively new to programming in Python, you've seen Dunder methods, um, because we have Dunder init. Um, and, and so let's use it as an example to explain what we're talking about here. We call it a Dunder method, a short for the double underscore at the beginning and the end of the method name. But the particularly interesting thing about Dunder methods is that we almost never call them explicitly. We can. You definitely can call object dot Dunder init and it will do what you think it will do. But you generally wouldn't do that. Instead, the interpreter basically recognizes situations where a certain Dunder method is called for to do the work that we want to get done. Um, and it calls the Dunder method for us. Um, so in this case, I want to create an object. So I'm going to use the name of the class, um, storage jar, pass in an argument, and call this. And so what happens? Um, we didn't have a, we, we didn't explicitly define there's no storage jar function that's getting called. What happens is the interpreter says, okay, you want to construct an object of type storage jar, so I'll call the constructor. As an aside, we often colloquially refer to Dunder and init as the constructor in Python, but strictly speaking, it's not. Um, and if you think about it for a second, if it's the constructor, how could it have self um, when self doesn't exist before the object is constructed? This is the initializer. The constructor in Python is another Dunder method, Dunder new. And it is the, the method that creates the object and returns the instance value to us. The reason why many of us have programmed in Python for a long time and never really thought about this is that you practically never call, or you would never implement your own Dunder new. In fact, I've been programming in Python for over 20 years, and the only time I have ever implemented a Dunder new was out of academic interest. Um, generally, we're happy to call on it. But Dunder new gets called. The Dunder new returns an instance of this type. And then the interpreter says, ah, now I'll call Dunder init to do whatever the programmer said we want to have happen now. We didn't call it. The interpreter decided to call it for us. Now, that's important, because that leads to a couple warnings I want to point out. This is Python, and Python gives us an extraordinary amount of freedom, and in return, we're expected to exercise a degree of restraint. Um, so there is nothing that will stop you from defining a method of your own that begins and ends with double underscores, your own Dunder method. You might, in your class, implement a Dunder Tom method, and while that would be an extraordinary good taste, it would be a bad idea. It would be a bad idea because for two reasons. First off, for the rest of us who read your code, that's going to be confusing. We're going to look at Dunder Tom and be like, I've never seen what? And it's not going to make sense. Um, and, but what's more, remember the, the, the real utility of Dunder methods is that we don't have to call them. The interpreter decides when to call them for us. The interpreter is not going to call your off-brand Dunder Tom method. It's not going to work in the way you want. Um, also, someday in the future, hopefully, there will actually be an, an actual Dunder Tom method, and now your special weird one that you created suddenly doesn't make any sense because it probably doesn't do what the real one's going to do. Another thing we could do is we could define a method that uses one of the official Dunder names, but we won't conform to its signature, so we have a Dunder method that is supposed to return, I don't know, a string, and instead we're going to return uh, an integer. Um, the interpreter won't stop it from, from doing that. That's definitely not an error. But if we do that, um, the, the bugs that are going to result from doing something like that are not going to make you very many friends. So we can do it, and let's just agree we're not going to. <laughs> 
Now, what I want to do from here is we're going to look at a few situations in which we'd like to, to give our classes some special power. And we're going to do that by implementing certain Dunder methods, and we're going to walk through how we do that. So for each of these cases, um, we'll talk about it for a few minutes, and then we'll take a little break, and there's a, a programming problem for you to work on to, to illustrate the idea. Um, at the time that we take those breaks, um, all I will, if, if a, you have an individual question that you want to ask, can you tell me why my code isn't working right here, I'll roam around um, and, and perhaps help you out with it, or perhaps your neighbor, or perhaps Katie can help you out with that. At the very end of it, um, we'll also have a little bit of time, hopefully, for some general questions um, that we, you, we can take. And as I said, I really don't expect that most people are going to complete all the programming exercises, even if you want to, in the couple hours that we have. Um, we have the rest of the weekend for that. So first off, let's talk about strings. This is kind of a nice example to get started. For some of you, this one will be pretty familiar. Um, and for some of you, it might not. Either way, let's talk about it. So here I have a class, a parrot, um, that I want to implement. And I'm going to construct um, an object, p, um, of type parrot. Um, and now I'm going to take that object and pass it as an argument to print. Um, and what happens? It's going to print out something like this. Might be slightly different if you do this on your machine. Um, but what's going on here? We know that print wants strings. We know that p is a parrot and a parrot is not a string, and yet everything works. So what's happening? Well, when we invoke print p on our parrot p, the first thing that happens is the interpreter is going to check and say, have we implemented a particular dunder method, dunder stir? Uh, this is a method that takes self as an argument and returns a string, and we'll take that return string and we'll print that. Our parrot does not implement dunder stir. So then it's going to look and say, well, what about dunder wrapper? for representation, that should also return a string. Um, and if that's available, we'll go ahead and print that. We didn't implement, we didn't override the default implementation of repr, but there is a default implementation from the base object. And so that's what got called. That's what produced that output down there. Um, but if we're not satisfied with that, and we're probably not, then we can implement these two Dunder methods ourselves uh, and control what the actual strings we get. So we'll modify our parrot by implementing um, a dunder stir that will return a particular string, depending on, on what's going on with our parrot, and a dunder wrapper, which returns a different string. Um, and if we just jump ahead here, we can check and see what does that look like. So now we construct our parrot. When we call print on the parrot, it uses the result returned from dunder stir. If we call stir on a parrot, again, it uh, gives me back the string that is returned from dunder stir. If I call repr on a parrot, it'll give me back the string that is returned from the dunder repr method. The obvious question now is, why do we need two methods? Um, the intent is this. Dunder stir is going to return what we're going to call a user-friendly string, and dunder wrapper is going to return what we call a developer-friendly string. What that means is highly dependent on your context. Maybe you're going to actually use the string in like user interface. Maybe you're going to use the string to write a log file line. I don't know. Um, but you're going to have to decide for yourself what the user-friendly version of the string is. Um, but if you're implementing dunder stir, you have some idea that there is such a string, and you want to implement it. The developer-friendly string, again, well, you're the developer. I guess you get to decide what is the friendly string. But there is a convention that says that um, if it's practical to do so, the string you should return should be a string that looks like a call to the constructor that produces the object that you're repping. So that is why we do have this string down here. Uh, that looks like a call to constructing a parrot. OK. As an aside, there are two other string methods that we're not going to talk about, well, stringy methods like this. There is a bytes, a dunder bytes method that returns a byte string. Again, that, that, that represents your object. And there is a dunder format method, which allows you to specify a format string that controls the formatting of the string that is produced from it. But for now, we're just going to worry about dunder stir and dunder repr.
And this is one of those times where we'll take a break. So if you clone the repository and have it there, there's a strings directory. Inside that directory is a Python source file with a couple little questions for you to answer. This one is pretty straightforward. So I'm thinking we'll stop for um, five-ish, ten-ish minutes um, and give you a chance to have a look at that. And like I say, if somebody has a question, you can get my attention or get our, somebody else's attention, and we'll try to help you with that. But it's a good way to get started. So let's all take a few minutes and write a little Python, because after all, that's fun.
Okay. Hopefully we've had a chance to dig into that. Um, and now let's go on and look at our next case. Again, if you find that you, you didn't get... Ah, thank you, Katie. <laughs> okay. Um, if you, again, if you find you didn't get through that exercise, that's fine. Like I said, I'm available all weekend. Next thing I want to talk about is operator overloading. Um, and again, by way of introduction, let's go back and look at what we were doing with strings. Um, we have operators like double equals, um, and other comparison operators. We have operators like addition and multiplication. And in the, cases, in the case of strings, we've decided that those operations that we might ordinarily think of in a numeric context make sense for strings. Um, and, and so we can do these things. Um, and, I mean, this is common in a lot of languages. A lot of languages allow you to, in some way, take, take operations, um, to operations that typically have arisen out of a numeric sort of context, and said, I can, I can lift that idea out and, and present it in other contexts, like strings. In some languages, and definitely in Python, um, we have the option to overload these operators for our own classes, if we decide that those operations make sense for us. Um, and the way to do that is you have to implement the right dunder methods. So, again, here's a class, um, which represents cheese. Cheese is terrific. I'm sure many of us love cheese, only slightly less than we love Python. Um, and it makes sense to say, I ought to be able to compare two cheeses and decide that they are equal in some sense. Um, to do double equals on, on, on two different cheese objects um, and get a sensible result. And so to do that, I need to implement a particular Dunder method, Dunder EQ, for you know, equality. Um, and let's take a second and look at this pattern. This is a very typical pattern for what you would do in a comparison operation like that. Um, so we see the arguments are self and other. Normally, what we want to think about is that self is the object on the left-hand side of the double equals, and other is the object on the right-hand side of the double equals. Strictly speaking, that's not always true, but it's true enough. Um, what are we going to do? Well, first, we're going to check on what is other. We don't have to check self, because this is an instance method of a cheese object, so self is definitely cheese. But other could be anything at this point, so we need to decide whether this object is something that we're ready to perform the comparison on. If it is, if this is instance passes, then we perform the comparison that we've decided is relevant for our objects, Two cheeses are the same if they have the same name and if they are equally runny. Um, and we'll return the result of that comparison. If other is something that's not cheese, if other is a cracker, we're going to return not implemented. Not implemented is a special object, kind of like none is a special object. Um, and in this context, when we return not implemented, what we're basically saying is, I don't know what to do here. Now, you could be like, why not raise a not implemented exception? That's not what we're doing here. Um, and the reason why is, OK, we've decided, imagine I have cheese on the left-hand side, equals, equals, and I don't know, a cracker on the right-hand side. The interpreter says, OK, cheese, let me see your Dunder EQ. The Dunder EQ says, that other thing is a cracker. I don't know what to do here. I will return not implemented to tell you I don't know what to do. At that point, the interpreter says, OK, Cracker, you're up. Can you compare yourself to cheese and give me an answer? And if Cracker can, then you'll get a sensible result. So that's why we return not implemented. If we raise the not implemented exception, we would cut off the opportunity to inquire of other if it can handle the comparison. So specifically, let's suppose we have cheese, and then just for the sake of argument, let's have some fruit so we can do, look at some different comparisons. And I'll construct some Edom, and I'll construct some cheddar. And while we're at it, I'll make, get an apple. I'm starting to think about lunch. Um, and we'll think about some comparisons. If I can compare Edom with cheddar, it turns out their names are not the same. Edom is not the same thing as cheddar. We're going to return false. That makes sense. I'm actually going to skip ahead. If I compare Edom with Edom, that's definitely the same thing. This is, you know, reflexive. Um, so it returns true. What happens when I compare Edom with Apple? So we understand the first part. 
The interpreter said, hey, Edom, are you the same as this apple? And Edom returned, not implemented, basically saying, I don't know. I can't answer that question for you. Then the interpreter says, hey, Apple, do you know if you're the same as the Edom? And Apple says, yes, I can do that comparison. It can do that comparison because there is a default implementation of Dunder EQ that a Apple has inherited because we didn't, and we didn't overwrite it. The default implementation says two objects compare equal equal if they are the exact same object. So the default implementation of equal equals is object identity. The object Apple is not the same object as the object Edom, so Apple's Dunder EQ is what returned the false. So yeah, no exception gets raised. And this may be a good thing, and it may be a bad thing. It kind of depends on the context. Is it ever okay to raise an exception in uh, uh, Dunder EQ? Absolutely. But it means something different. So, again, in the cheese's Dunder EQ, it said, if you're comparing me with another cheese, I know what to do. Anything else, I return not implemented, which indicates I don't have an answer for you. But let's... Um, let's suppose uh, we have a slightly different scenario. Let's suppose we're writing software for a kosher deli, and we're going to try to compare cheese with meat. That's definitely not kosher. We're not going to do that. Um, so we might say, check to see if other is an instance of meat, and at that point, we could raise a type error. So that has a different meaning. If we raise an exception, we're saying, yeah, I know what to do in this case. I'm going to raise an exception. You shouldn't be making this comparison. That's a problem. You need to handle it. Not implemented is different. Not implemented is just, I don't know, but you're free to try other options. OK? So there, we've got basically the whole set of different comparisons that operators we can do, and we've got the corresponding dunders. So let's be clear, you don't have to override any of these if they don't make sense, and there are lots of situations where only some of them make sense. In the case of cheese, um, it's not crazy to think we can talk about equality and not equal, but I think that anything that tries to rank cheeses on a greater than less than scale is way too controversial for what we're talking about here. So we're not going to do that. Um, another thing to know, so if you implement Dunder EQ like we have, and now you try to do the not equals comparison on two cheeses, the interpreter will get it right. The interpreter will say, well, you didn't implement not equals, but you implemented equals. You implemented Dunder EQ, and I can just negate the result and get the right answer. But that's not ideal. If you anticipate that you're going to do not equals comparisons, you should explicitly write the Dunder NE, in part so that you save the interpreter the trouble of figuring out what to do. It just says, I'm going to use your Dunder NE. And in part, it makes your code more clear and explicit, which we know from the Zen of Python um, is desirable. If, in your classes, you want to implement all of these, um, I would encourage you to look in, the, in Funk Tools. There's a deck writer called Total Ordering, which basically says, implement Dunder EQ and implement greater than, or one of the others. Um, and it'll, it'll add the rest for you. So save you some effort and get the result you want. It's worth it to talk a little bit about arithmetic operations because there's a, um, a bit of difference. Um, so again, um, let's suppose we want to add two cheeses together. We've decided, maybe this is a bad idea, but I am American. We've decided that it makes sense to, to blend two cheeses together. And we're going to say, how does that mean? I'm going to take the names and munge them together, and I'm going to take the mean of the runniness of the cheeses, and I'm going to create a new cheese and give you that back. So again, what do I do? I, compare, I, I, I check on other, because I'm only prepared to add cheese with cheese. We're not going completely nuts here. Um, and if it is, then I'll go ahead and perform the addition. And again, if not, I don't know what to do. So I'll return not implemented, saying you're on your own. Now, once we've implemented addition, again, we could say, if you can add, multiplication is just repeated addition. So we could talk about multiplying cheese here. You might think I'm going off the deep end here, and you're probably right, but it's useful at least as an example. This situation is a little bit more complicated, because now we're multiplying things together of two different types. 
So if I implement Dunder Mull for multiply, then that will handle expressions where I have cheese on the left and an integer on the right, because that's how I'm going to implement multiply. Just say I can multiply um, a cheese times an integer. Here's an example where I might want to raise an exception, and if you give me a float, I'm going to say, nah. And if you give me a complex, we're definitely out of here. Um, but it handles that case. On the other hand, what happens if I say 3 times Colby? Now, the interpreter is going to try to look and say, what's the multiplication method for the integer 3? Because that's the thing on the left, and that's, that's not going to work for us. So we definitely want to implement the reflected multiplication, RMO, to handle that case. Um, we didn't have to do that for add, because any time that we're adding, we handle cheese plus cheese. So it doesn't matter right or left. You notice our add wasn't commutative, but that's fine. Um, so we might, we, we, in, but in this case, because the two things that we're multiplying are different types, we definitely need to implement both versions of the multiplication dunder. While we're at it, there's a thing called imol. There's also a thing called iAd, and we could have done that, um, which will handle times equals. And we can make it do what we want to do. And because my background is in maths, I'm going to leave the implementation as an exercise. Um, <coughs> also, to be clear, while with comparison operators, I gave you the list because it was short. For the rest of these sort of arithmetic operators, the list is not short. So I'm just going to give you a link. And with that, there's an exercise. This one might take a little bit longer. But, so let's take 10-ish minutes to give this a go.
Okay. I want to move on, but I want to take a second to point out, um, in the world of programmers, there, um, there are mixed views about operator overloading. There are programmers who think that operator overloading is fun and we should do it, and there are oper or, sorry, there are programmers who think that operator overloading is some sort of crime against nature and you should not do it. And that's an honest and reasonable difference of opinion. Plenty of people have been anti-operator overloading and then gone on to live perfectly normal lives. Um, I personally like operator overloading, and if you disagree, that's totally fine, and if you want to debate with me about that, that's also totally fine, provided that two conditions are true. One is that we are in a pub at the time, and two is that you at least offer to buy me a beer. I may or may not want the beer at that moment, but at least as a courtesy, you should offer. What did I want to talk about next? I guess that's why I have slides. Oh yeah, iterators. Um, so again, we'll look at our example of strings, because strings do what we want. A nice thing about strings, a thing we do all the time, so a string is a collection of values. I mean, it makes sense that we might want to look at the individual items in that collection, that we might want to iterate over that collection. So we can do things like have a for loop and iterate over the string and obtain one value, one character at a time from the string, and do whatever it is we want to do with that value. And a lot of really interesting things follow out of the fact that strings um, are iterables, that we can iterate over them in the way that, that we see here. Formally speaking, what's going on here? A string is an iterable. What makes something an iterable is that it can supply an iterator. So in the case of the for loop, the interpreter says, takes the iterable string and says, give me your iterator, which is of type string iterator, and then it uses that iterator to obtain the characters one at a time from the string. Um, and not shockingly, the way this happens is that we implement Dunder methods. An iterable, like a string, implements Dunder iter, which is a method that takes self as an argument and returns an iterator. An iterator is an object that implements Dunder next. So the iterator has some access to the collection of objects that the, the iterable holds. Um, and repeated calls to, to the iterators next uh, will yield you know, one item at a time from the collection until we have exhausted the collection of all its items. And at that point, the call to next will raise a soft iteration exception. So in the case of the for loop, the, interpre the interpreter gets the string's string iterator, calls next on the string iterator, which returns one character at a time, until eventually we get to the end of the string, and then the string iterator raises a stop iteration exception and tells us to break out of the loop. So we're talking about two distinct, closely related, but distinct objects in this case, usually. There are cases where a class is its own iterator. So it's iter, just returns self, and the class implements its next. But that's, uh, that's a less common case, and there are some interesting consequences from doing it that way. Um, but we're, we're going to set that one aside. We're going to think of these things as two different objects. So here, I have a class. Um, I'm thinking about breakfast tomorrow. Um, and the class contains, a, as an attribute, it has a collection, perhaps a quite, a, quite a large collection. Um, and it makes sense that we ought to be able to iterate over the collection of foods that we get at breakfast. I'd like to be able to do that. So in other words, it makes sense for breakfast to be iterable, which means we need to implement iter. There's more than one way to implement iter that satisfies our requirements, and so I'm going to talk about three different ways that we can do it. First of all, the breakfast class's items is a list. A list is already iterable. We know that. You can for over a list. So a list is already an iterable, which means it already can supply us with an iterator, and that iterator probably does what we want. So breakfast's iter method 
can just go to its list, items, and say, give me your iterator, and I'll return that. And now we've done what we want. We have produced an object that we can return that the interpreter can call next on until it gets all the items that we're having for breakfast. Another way to do that is we could use a generator function. So because this function yields, um, what it returns is a generator, which generators are also iterators. So this function will return a generator that you can call next on, and it will do what you think. It will iterate over the items in the breakfast and, and yield up one of those items at a time and eventually exhaust the collection and break out. And so that works. The third way we could do it is we could implement our own custom breakfast iterator class as a companion to the breakfast class. So remember, the breakfast class is iterable because it implements Dunder Iter. The breakfast iterator class is, as the name promises, we're going to write it so that it is an iterator, which means it implements Dunder Next. So we're going to give it, with that self argument, we're going to give it the list of items or a copy of that list that it can use to respond to repeated calls for next um, and give up the, the, the items out of the list. Um, so why do we have the three different approaches? Well, I mean, part of it is a, a consequence of the, the very common case. Very commonly, when your class wants wants to be iterable, it turns out that you have some attribute that's already iterable. And if that attribute does what you want, then the first approach is terrific. All the work is done. We just had to write a couple lines. And that's fine. Um, that's fine, provided that the list's iter iterator does exactly what we want. If it doesn't do exactly what we want, if we want to do just a bit more, or perhaps we have a situation where we don't have ready access to an iterator that we can just grab, we might want to take the second approach. Um, because besides just yielding the item, there's an opportunity here for us to do some extra things that the normal list iterator doesn't do. Um, and so this is a nice way to do it. The third example is the most work, because now we have to define a completely different class. But again, why do we like that? Um, because we want our iterator to have a lot of capabilities that we don't get out of either of the first two examples, basically. Um, one, this is the, the, in particular, the one case where you are almost certainly going to do it this way, is that you don't have an attribute that is already easy to iterate over. Um, so you need to do quite a lot of work in order to get your iteration to happen. Um, if you find yourself in that scenario, and you definitely can, uh, there are realistic real-world scenarios that include that, um, then you probably want to implement a custom class that implements your Dunder Next and that you return from your iter and lets you do what you want to do. Regardless of the approach, you know, having implemented iter um, and produce an object that can respond to next, we can now loop over our breakfast and do whatever it is we want to do. And if you aren't convinced, try it for yourself. And let's take a 10-ish minutes um, and, and have a go at this. <laughs>
Okay. Somebody asked a really good question just now, and so I want to share it with the whole group because it really it was an omission on my part to not mention this earlier. So remember, an iterable implements dunder iter and returns an iterator. And the iterator is probably a different kind of object than the iterable in most cases. However, an iterator, a thing that implements dunder next and let, gives us access to the items in the collection, um, it's common, in fact, it's probably des desirable, that it is also an iterable, and it should return itself. So if your object is an iterator, if your object implements dunder next, then it sh actually should implement dunder iter and just return itself. So for example, if you obtain the list iterator from a list and call iter on that, it will give you back itself. It'll say, you want an iterator, you already have one, uh, um, and it will do that. So, normally, an iterable, normally, you know, the, the iterables that we start with are not themselves iterators. They'll return an object of a different type to serve as the iterator. But once an object is an iterator, it, then it should, probably should return itself if you call iter on it. it. It should be its own iterator. I'm sure we could come up with an example there. That's not true but we'd be thinking way harder than we want to this close to lunch. Um, one nice thing I think about um, iterables and iterators is it's fairly easy to implement. I mean, you get a lot of power out of it. I feel like in terms of like um, value for effort, the iterable iterator pattern is itself, is, is ranks really well, really well on that scale. Okay, the natural thing well, now that we've got iterators is to move on and talk about sequences. And not shockingly, we'll think about it from strings, because a string is a sequence. It's, it's a collection, but we have the concept of, of each item in the collection has a position. Um, and so it makes sense to also talk about it as a sequence. And that's the thing that lets us do the square bracket kind of notation there to say, give me the item at position four, give me the item at position one. And also because this is Python, if we're talking about a sequence, you probably want to support slicing as well, just like, like strings do. Um, so <coughs> the fact that we can do this with a string tells us that the string is a sequence. And it's not surprising that, that string, that sequences and iterators, iterables, go together in the sense that if your object is a sequence, then it's definitely also iterable. So logically speaking, I'm talking about here, like that, that if an object, you know, it's a natural consequence of being a sequence that you're an iterable. There are definitely iterables that are not sequences. Uh, an easy example is a Python set. We don't have any concept of a position, a, an element of a set, is, it's just a bag of things. There's no concept of where does an element sit in the collection. So, um, so we can iterate over a set. We can obtain the items of the set one at a time, but there's no, no sense of ordering. A set is definitely not a sequence. Now, a breakfast. A breakfast is probably a sequence. I suppose it depends on how you do it. If you're the kind of person who eats your food one item at a time, which I am, then your breakfast is a sequence. If you're the kind of person who hops around the plate, Besides being a psychopath, your breakfast is not a sequence, it's, but it's still iterable. Whatever, for our purposes, breakfast is, it makes sense to talk about breakfast as sequences. And one way, clue um, is that, again, look, our breakfast stores its elements in a list, which is a sequence. So that that's strongly hints at the idea that we, we actually think of it that way. Um, and so let's make it explicitly that way. What do we do? We implement some dunders. For starters, we need to implement the dunder get item. So this is a thing when you say square brackets index gives you back the thing at that index. Get item is the thing that, that enables that behavior. In our case, again, this is pretty easy because we've got a list which we can get an item for by index. 
Um, and so we'll just return that. Notice actually I say key instead of index because key could be an integer indicating the position of one element in the list, or it could be a slice. Um, you know, key isn't always just an, uh, an, in, an index. Um, so I'm using a slightly more generic term here. But again, what am I doing? I'm just leveraging the capability that's already present in the list, which makes sense because it does what I want, mostly. If you're a sequence, you're also at this point kind of obligated, you must implement Dunder Lin so that I can query your object and it will tell me how many items are in its sequence. Um, and again, we can get that by just using the length of the list, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, but these two, implementing these two Dunder methods are the thing that we can add to our breakfast and make it a sequence. Now, I say first approach, I kind of don't like this on a philosophical level, well, even on a functional programming level, so let's talk about the second approach. And the second approach has to do with slices. So I don't have any problem with the idea that if I say, give me the breakfast square brackets four, that that's, well, it's spam, um, that that's not a breakfast. That's just an item of food. It's not the same type. I don't have a problem with that. In the same way that when you obtain an item from a list, that item is not necessarily a list. It, it has whatever type it has. But once you slice, you're saying I'm taking a sub-collection of a larger collection. Well, no, I'm saying I'm taking a sub-sequence of a larger sequence. So that thing should be the same type as the sequence it has. So in this case, what I'm going to say, if the key you gave me was a slice, then, again, my items is a list, so I'll take the corresponding slice of that list of items, self dot items at key, in this case is now a slice, so it is a, a, a list obtained from the item list, and I'll use that to construct a new object of type breakfast, which presumably has a subset of the items in the original breakfast. So I'm saying that when we slice an object, we should get back an object of the same type. You could argue that we should take it a step further and that actually, even if I only get one item, that should be also of type breakfast. It's okay to just have toast for breakfast. Um, and the real answer is it depends. None of the three approaches I've described is right or wrong. It's dependent on the context of the problem you're trying to solve. So if I'm saying that I think the most common case is like the list case, where when we access an individual item by index, we don't expect to get a list back. When I get an, take an individual item off the breakfast plate, I'm not calling that breakfast. I'm just calling it spam. Um, but once I take a collection of items out of the larger breakfast collection, now I expect to get back a thing of type breakfast. Um, but really, you have to look at the problem you're solving and decide what sh you should return it in, in each case. But it's probably certainly the case that the slice situation bears a little more looking at than the individual situation. Now we need to talk about one of my favorite topics, mutability versus immutability. Um, so if your collection, if your sequence is mutable, that means we can change the values of the elements that are present in the sequence. I can add or remove things from the sequence, or I can just swap out uh, uh, and put in a new item at a particular position in the sequence. If that's true, then we say the sequence is mutable. A list is mutable. Um, on the other hand, if we say once we form the collection and form the sequence, we can't change the values of any of the items in it, then that thing is immutable. A string is a sequence that is immutable. If your sequence is immutable, then you implement dunder get item and dunder len, and your, your work is finished. You, you've done what you want to do. If your sequence is mutable, if you expect to be able to change the items on the list, if your breakfast menu allows for substitution, then you need to implement some additional dunders to support the mutability. And in particular, we need to do these three. The astute observer will notice that one of them is not a dunder but you still got to implement it, so we're going to talk about it. So the set item is the thing that would let us say breakfast square brackets five equals eggs. 
right? So it says, take whatever was in position five in the breakfast, um, it's now something different. That's what this, the dunder set item is doing. It says, whatever value is currently at position key in the list, it's now has a different value. The del item says, let's take something out of the list. I want spam, 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 baked beans, spam, spam, and spam, hold the baked beans. We can, we can del the baked beans if we know its position in the list. And so dunder del item lets us do that. And finally, we're also expected to implement the non-dunder insert, right, which says, um, stick this value at position four in the, the sequence, and then shift the other items as necessary in order to, to make that happen. We need it to let that happen also. Um, again, in, in the case of our example, and this really is the most common case, we have an underlying sequence, a list in our case here, that makes it pretty easy to implement these methods, but we definitely need to implement them if we're going to call ourselves a mutable sequence. There are other methods that you can implement in the case of both immutable and mutable sequences. There are some optional other ones. The ones that I'm presenting, I'm going to say those are like, that's the, the minimum viable sequence. You must implement these things. Um, in order to call your object a sequence, but there are some others. Um, rather than talking about it for a long time, I'll point you to the collections.abc um, in the collections library. The collections library actually has a bunch of abstract base classes for a whole bunch of different kinds of collections, including mutable and immutable sequences, and in particular, breaks it down into what are the methods that your, say, mutable sequence must implement and what are some optional methods that your sequence can support um, and makes it easy for you to do that. So you can actually you know, inherit from the abstract base class and do it formally, or you can simply use the collections.abc as a reference to just let you decide what to do, and regularly I'll do either, depending on the particular problem I'm working on. But that is actually, that's a super handy web page to look at for if you're implementing any sort of collection type. Um, in the case of sequences, like, I, I don't keep it straight in my head. I go look at that web page. So that's why I'm giving that to you now. At any rate, if we've implemented, so now if we implement the, ver the appropriate methods, we can create an object of type breakfast. We can access an individual item off the plate. Or we can, as I say, we can hold the baked beans if we want to, by removing that in play, and do the other things that you expect to do with the sequence. I was thinking about that, yeah. Okay, guess what? Let's take about 10 minutes to practice that one. Um, so there's an exercise for you to look at. Um, and then we will talk about one more thing. <laughs>
Okay. So recall that when we talked about iterators. I said that I thought iterators were cool. They were like the, the most kind of power, the most value in return for the amount of effort you put into getting them. Um, and the fact that we can make just about any object you want iterable, um, I think is a, is a hugely useful thing. It's a real selling point in favor of Python. Um, the case in sequences, I think the, the actual, you know, do you need to implement a sequence of your object? It's, it's more effort and not necessarily as much value, but it's still pretty cool. But I would say sequence takes away the prize for like the most G whiz factor for me. The fact that in Python we can define um, our own classes and create our own objects and we can support that square bracket key notation, um, to me is, is, like I said, it's kind of the coolest thing that we're looking at today, uh, you know, is that, that we can do that. Um, but neither of these things is my favorite, and nothing else that we have looked at this morning is my favorite thing. These are not my children. I'm allowed to have a favorite. Um, and my favorite is context managers. I really like context manager. I think it's a beautiful feature in Python. Um, yeah, it's an extraordinarily beautiful feature of Python. It's a really useful thing to be able to do. And particular thing about what is it I like about it, when we look dig into context managers, it's surprising how little there is to do. But I wouldn't say that context managers are easy. Depending on what you're trying to do in your situation, uh, implementing a context manager might be rather complicated. Um, but what it is, the reason why context managers are my favorite of all the topics we're talking about is because context managers are no more difficult than they have to be. I, I, and I really think that's true. Um, to the extent that, that you ever find implementing a complex manager difficult, it's because the, you're trying to solve a difficult problem. It's not because the context manager is making your life more difficult. Um, that is a, a really desirable property. The more you can say that about any particular programming language, that its features are not any more complicated than they need to be, that they're not any more difficult than they need to be, I mean, I think that is the, the, the ultimate measure of the quality of a programming language. So context managers. I didn't, couldn't come up with a string example to talk about. But here's a very common example of a context manager. So I want to open a file. Um, there's more than one way to open a file. You may have opened files different ways, but this is how I like to do it. I use the with. I make the call to open that opens the file. Um, open returns that file handle. Um, which is assigned to that optional as script. So it says ass assign the return of open to the variable script. Um, then, I, I, in this case, because I have access to the script object, I go ahead and do what I want to do with it, and then eventually I, I drop out the bottom of my code block here. Um, now, why do I like that? Well, first off, because it's very clear. Looking at this code, I, f I feel like it's, it's very easy to read. Even if you don't know Python, you can look at that code, and you have a pretty good idea of what it's doing. And that's what it's doing. I like it because, and this is another thing, it's, it, it makes it difficult to make errors. Because regardless of what happens, um, when we exit this block, the block that is introduced with the with statement, that file is going to get closed. If it raises an exception, the file gets closed. If we just forget to worry about it, the file gets closed. You know, no matter what, at the end of that, that block, whatever needs to happen with that file object when we're done with it, that file handle, is going to happen. That's the thing we're getting out of a context manager. Um, so strictly speaking, what's happening here? That expression, in, in our case, that call to open, I mean, that's a function, what does it do? It opens the files, but it's going to return a thing, and that thing needs to implement context manager, which means it's got to have the right dunders implemented. Um, so whatever, whatever comes after the with needs to be an expression that will return a thing that implements context manager. Um, if you want to access that thing in the body, you can do that optional as variable name. There are context managers that don't return any particular value because you don't actually need to access them in the body. That is a legit thing to do. In fact, we're going to look at that in just a second. 
So the as script is optional, but it's certainly common. I like this code because it's very elegant. So, like I said, the beautiful thing about this is that it's no more complicated, no more difficult than it needs to be. Your object can be a context manager if it implements two Dunder methods, one called Dunder Enter, enter and one Dunder Exit. So the idea, the problem we're trying to solve here is that first, um, as we enter this code block, we need to get some things ready. We need to prepare some resources that, that, that are going to be important in the context um, described by our, our with code block. Um, in our case, we want to open a file. But it could be other things. It could be we want to get a network connection, um, other stuff. Um, there's something that we want to do to get ready. That happens in the enter. Um, then, when we exit the block, for any reason whatsoever, we want to do something to clean up after ourselves. That happens in the exit, because the important thing about the exit is that it gets called when you exit the code block, introduced with the width, for any reason. So if you just execute all the lines in the block and drop out the bottom, exit gets called. If an exception is raised in the code block, um, and, and so execution is interrupted, exit gets called. If you break out of the, the, the width, exit gets called. So, I mean, it lets our, our, our code be very clean. If you think about the, the file example, it basically says, look, we all know the file needs to, be get, needs to get closed. You know, let's, let's not make a big deal out of it. Um, let's just handle it quietly. And uh, the context manager does that really beautifully. So I've got to do these two things. What has to happen in these methods? It's really up to us. With almost every other Dunder method we've looked at, there was a pretty clear idea of this method needs to return this sort of thing. Um, in the case of enter and exit, there's not much of that. There's a little bit, but there's not much. So here's a very simple example of a context manager. Uh, so I have an enter that says that when we enter, the, the code block is by the width. We're going to execute that thing. It's going to print its. I have an exit. We'll talk about its argument types in a minute. But when we exit the code block for any reason, we're going to print that message. About the other arguments, those arguments are important if an exception is raised in the code block. So ex type is the type of exception that gets raised. Ex val is the actual exception object's value. Ex trace is the stack trace. If no exception is raised in the block, then those three variables will each be equal to none. Now, you don't have to handle your exceptions in the exit. I want to make that really clear. Um, and there are plenty of reasons why you don't, yeah, it's, it's probably not your job to handle the exception. But you have the opportunity. So, um, you know, in the case of the file, you know, if we try to open the file and the file's not there, um, we don't need to, you know, we're, we're happy to let that exception propagate. You tried to open a file that's not there. You have problems that it's not the, the context manager's job to solve. We'll let that exception propagate. But on the other hand, uh, perhaps there's a common exception and you do want to handle it you, and let it go away quietly. We can do it there. That's the one case where we have a special requirement. Um, and that special requirement is if you handle the exception, in your exit and you don't want to propagate, then you need to return true um, or something truthy. If you see the exception and you want the exception to propagate up, you need to return false or something falsy. Um, if you don't care, if there's no exception, then it doesn't really matter what you return because there's nothing to get propagated up. So in this case, we're not worried about what we're returning because we're, we're not doing any exception handling. But again, just to restate, if your exit handles the exception and you don't want it to propagate, return true. If maybe you do do something with the exception, um, but you still want it to propagate, return false. Um, really, in a lot of ways, you can think of the exit is a lot like the finally in a try finally, because it is this thing that says, I'll clean all that up. Um, 
after it. But again, it's, it isn't just for exceptions because if you exit normally, then again, you still want to clean up after yourself and uh, the exit is where you do it. So if we have this announcer class, we can now use it in a with. So here I say with announcer. So again, what does that do? I mean, it constructs the announcer object and it returns the value of the announcer object. And that value that is returned is the thing that needs to be a context manager. So that thing that comes after the with, in my case it's called the announcer, needs to return an object that implements dunder enter and dunder exit. In our case, I mean, the, the, this object we're constructing is the context manager, it's there. Um, we don't want to use the value of announcer inside the body of our with block, so we left off the as variable name because that's optional. Now I do a thing, and what gets printed? So, I mean, well, it's kind of walk through what's happening. With announcer, it constructs the announcer object, says, here, here's a thing, it's a context manager. The interpreter says, cool, let me get a hold of your enter and exit methods, I'm going to need those, and we enter the block. Immediately, we execute the enter function, and that's why it prints its. Then we do whatever we're doing in the block, we print Monty Python's Flying Circus. And then we're leaving the block, we're done. So exit gets called, and that's what returns the and now for something completely different. I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry to say. So it's my favorite thing, because I believe it is the most beautiful of all the things that we've talked about. Um, and I started this off by saying that there are lots of reasons to love Python. Um, and we all have our own reasons, and perhaps I said that, that I, I said that what I liked was that it, we had this sort of clear and powerfully expressive kind of syntax, so let's just express our ideas in code, but I could have been much more concise, and I could have said, why do I love Python? I love Python because it is beautiful. Um, and that is what I've tried to show you today. Now the plan from here, let's take a few minutes, if there are any kind of global questions, uh, take a few minutes and I can address those questions right now uh, if you, you want to, to bring forward a question. Remember, if you want to debate on the, whether or not it's acceptable to operate overloaders, let me remind you, this is not a pub. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Um, when those questions are finished, or if there aren't any, then the, the balance of the time is to finish up the exercise, um, and I'll, I'll be available to help you out with that. Um, or if you're, you're, you've had enough exercises, it's your chance to get to the head of the lunch queue. Thanks. So, questions? You're also a New Zealander. I have a question. All right. Can everyone please give Tom a clap? Just in case we didn't get to do the applause because people want to get snacks. There you go. Cool. Thanks. I can run around if people have questions or mm. not. I can repeat the question for you if you don't want to hold the mic. Uh, can you give a few more examples on good use of context managers? Can I give two more examples? I don't know if I can come up with two. The, um, a really obvious example that I sort of think about of what way to implement would be um, opening a network socket. That's a perfect case where I would use a context manager. Um, I definitely want that socket closed when I'm done with it. Okay. So again, um, I'm around all weekend, and I'm happy to get questions. Also, I'll promise a little thing to you, dangerous, but what the heck. Um, I have not yet, but I will before the end of the weekend. I will push to the tutorials repo a solutions branch with example solutions to the various problems. Okay? And again, please ask me if you have any questions about this or just whatever else all weekend, because that's kind of why we're having a conference. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>